We're going. We're good. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're so glad to have you guys join us this morning and hopefully take away some knowledge uh, about fair housing and about the uh, fair housing laws. Um, we are a nonprofit civil rights agency. Uh, we serve 29 counties in Central Alabama. Uh, we work with the Fair Housing Center in Northern Alabama, as well as the Center for Fair Housing in Mobile. Uh, we do receive grants from the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, or better known to most people as HUD. Um, and with these grants, it helps our center ensure equal housing opportunities for all people living in Central Alabama, regardless of your race, color, national origin, religion, gender, family status, or disability. Um, and also, our staff is dedicated to eliminating fair housing discrimination and enforcing the laws. Um, and we, we do that by um, testers that uh, when we get complaints in, we're able to um, get our test coordinator. She'll, she'll organize the testing and we'll go through testing. And if anything comes up and is flagged as possible housing issue, a housing indicator, uh, then we're able to um, go in and enforce the laws. And we're able to do that by either filing an accommodation or um, filing through HUD or sometimes even taking it to court. Um, and that's pretty much what we do here. Now a little bit about the Fair Housing Act. <clears throat> Uh, the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King on April the 4th, 1968, this caused a set of the worst outbreak of arson, looting, and criminal activity in the nation's history at that time. And once this happened, seven days afterwards, on April the 11th, 1968, the House Rule Committee passed the Fair Housing Act. Um, and uh, this prohibits discrimination in any activity related to selling or renting housing, including financing, insurance, or other housing related activities. Now, according to the National Housing Alliance in 2020's Housing Trend Report, 28,800 people reported complaints of fair housing discrimination in the U.S. in 2019, which to me indicates we still have a ways to go for fair housing. Um, and the three most common types of complaints in 2019 were based on disability, and that's a 58.90%. And then there was race at 16.47%, and family status at 17.71%. By this study here, we still have a good fight to fight for equal rights and equal housing uh, in the fair housing laws and uh, getting people to understand exactly what fair housing is. All right, Ms. Kim. Now, the Fair Housing Act has seven protected classes. Race, which is whether you're African American, you're Asian, Native American, Spanish. It's not limited to those examples, but those are a few examples. And then we have color, and that involves um, whether you're light skinned, you're black, you're white. Um, that is part of a discrimination. And then you have your national origin. So your birthplace, your ancestry, or your culture, just to name a few that are, are protected. Um, under the sex, gender, this includes sexual harassment, but it also includes domestic violence. With that being said, um, there are some, some rights that domestic violence um, for example, um, you're not able to evict because of a discrimin uh, discriminatory because there was a domestic violence altercation at the property. Um, and then we have religion. 
Um, and you can't be discriminated against your faith or the lack of whether you're atheist, Catholic, or Baptist. And then you have the family status. Now this is, uh, you can't be discriminated against having children in your house under the age of 18. And this also covers um, pregnancies. Um, families of uh, disability, now faith is gonna get into this and dive into the disability. So I'm not gonna go too far into that. That is a broad uh, subject there. And faith will get into that with you in a few minutes. All right. Now, who must comply with the Fair Housing Act? Anyone providing housing or housing related services must comply with the Fair Housing Act. Now, this includes rental agents and other employees, including maintenance workers. Um, this includes uh, Let's just say your property manager declines a client to have a, um, a service animal or emotional support animal. And then we have to file a uh, uh, accommodation. And what this will do is it goes to the property manager, but then it also goes to the district manager and it trickles. So it's not just this one person that is going to be held liable um, for the discrimination there. Um, contractors, owner of rental properties, real estate agents and companies and brokers, um, insurance provider, mortgage and home improvement, loan providers, uh, municipalities, real estates, um, Developers, we have condominium, uh, homeowners association, neighbors harassing behavior. So if you have a neighbor that is harassing you because of one of the seven uh, discriminatory uh, for fair housing, that neighbor can also um, be held for that. And then you have the nursing homes, newspapers, and other advertisers emergency shelter providers, and providers of college and universities and housing. All right. We ready to go to the next one? All right. Who is protected by the Fair Housing Act? Any aggrieved person who is harmed by housing discrimination may sue under the housing, Fair Housing Act, including anyone denied housing or housing related services. And those are denied under the seven um, indicated, uh, your race, your color, uh, your gender, national origin, family status, disability. Um, family members of anyone denied housing or housing related services. Uh, people associated with members of protected classes, i.e. your guests, family members, or friends, fair housing organizations and testers, and housing providers affected by discriminatory acts. Great. All right, legal versus unfair. There are many ways to discriminate. Not all forms of discrimination are unfair treatment or illegal. Okay. All right, Kim. Sorry, um, I think we are entering Faith's portion. Right? Okay. Hi, Hi everybody. I, I, you know, thank you for your time and uh, joining us today. I, um, I, I just want to say a little bit more about what Stacy just said about illegal versus unfair. We get a lot of calls from people who um, think they've been discriminated against um, because they experienced unfair treatment. Like somebody may call us and say, um, you know, I applied for an apartment and um, they, uh, they gave my cousin, who is a friend of the manager, an apartment long before they gave it to me. Well, if um, that is terrible and unfair, but if it wasn't 
if the action wasn't based on race, color, national origin, or the other protected classes, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate and unfair thing, but it doesn't violate the Fair Housing Act. Um, as Stacy said, we, we have a fair housing testing program and we send out community members to pose as home seekers or home buyers. And sometimes we'll get a complaint and somebody will say, you know, this, this manager um, was very mean to me and I think she's discriminating against me. And we'll send two testers in. Uh, we may send a white tester and, a, and an African-American tester in and they're both treated badly. Well, that's really bad customer service, but it wouldn't violate the Fair Housing Act unless one person was treated differently because of their race or, or the other protected classes. So, so that's why we always like to put in this slide just to explain the difference. Okay, ready to move on? What is illegal? Um, there, the Fair Housing Act, if anybody's interested, you can find it at 42 USC 3601 at SEC. But basically, the, the act sets out what are illegal actions. Um, first is refu refusing to rent or sell to a person or refusing to negotiate or otherwise make unavailable or deny housing because of race, color, national origin, religion, um, sex, family status, or disability. Um, also, denying that a unit is available for rent or sale when it is in fact available. This would be if they were to tell me, for instance, if, an, if a landlord would tell me that an apartment was available, but tell somebody else um, who is African American or of a different religion or has a disability that it's not available. So lying about availability is illegal. Steering a person to, to or away from a certain neighborhood or a part of a neighborhood or an apartment complex, um, a building in a complex is also illegal. Um, when we opened uh, back in 1995 and did our first round of, of testing, um, we found overwhelming staring of um, based on race to and from neighborhoods that were either predominantly white or predominantly African American. That is illegal under the Fair Housing Act. And we still find that, unfortunately, um, not as much, but we still do find that. Um, requiring higher security deposits or application fees. There are a lot of ways that landlords um, or sales agents can discriminate. One of the ways that we, one of the things that we do see are um, uh, different things that applicants are told that will discourage them or encourage them. One of them is you might tell one person that the security deposit is $250 and tell another person that it's $750. Or they might tell one person that they have to do a criminal record check, a criminal background check and not tell the other person. Or they might tell um, a Hispanic applicant that they need to show their social security card um, and they won't ask for that from a non-Hispanic tenant. So there are a lot of ways that, um, that rental managers um, or owners can discriminate at the time of application to make it easier or harder for somebody to rent. Okay. Kim, I think we're ready to move on. Okay, and um, we're concentrating on disability today. Um, I would say that of our complaints, probably um, at least 50% of them are based on disability. So, and a lot of the reason we wanted to do this training today is that um, a lot of the questions we get are related to disability. So, so we wanted to just have an opportunity to concentrate on this issue. 
The Fair Housing Act was amended in 1988 to include people with disabilities. And um, this inclusion makes is a little bit different from the other protected classes because for the other six protected classes, uh, the requirement is that people be treated the same way. And when Congress added disability as a protected class in 1988, the main difference is that um, landlords or sales agents, or it could even be insurance or mortgage lenders, um, have, to, uh, have to grant um, reasonable accommodations or reasonable modifications to, um, to ensure that people who have disabilities have the complete use and enjoyment of their apartments like anybody else. And that's, that's what we're mostly going to talk about this morning. Who has a disability? According to recent census data, one out of every five individuals has a physical or mental impairment covered by the Fair Housing Act. Um, and actually in Alabama, it's even higher. General disability provisions, discrimination in the sale or rental um, of housing is illegal or otherwise making unavailable because of handicap is illegal under the Fair Housing Act. And that is the same as the other protected classes. Um, what's added with regard to disability is the second, um, the second sentence, which is refusing to make reasonable accommodations in rules, practices, policies, or services when necessary to allow a person with a disability the opportunity to use the dwelling. Um, and the same goes with reasonable accommodation, reasonable modifications, and we'll talk about the difference. And also failing to comply with the design and construction requirements of the Fair Housing Act, and we'll get into that a little bit also. What is a disability? Um, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities or um, uh, having a history of such an impairment or being perceived as having such an impairment. Um, I'd like to say a little bit more about this. Uh, the having a history is generally refers, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but usually it's somebody who has a history of substance abuse or a history of um, mental illness. And we'll get into that a little bit better, uh, a little bit more, or perceived as having such an impairment. An example of that would be, you could have um, a person who is HIV positive, and they're actually not disabled and they, they don't have an impairment, but a landlord will look at them and say, oh, this person has um, AIDS or HIV and I don't want to rent to them. That's illegal under the Fair Housing Act, even though that person actually doesn't have a disability at this point in time. Okay. Examples of major life activities, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, walking, breathing, seeing, hearing, speaking, learning, working. Um, so very broad, if anybody has um, an impairment that affects their ability to engage in everyday activities, um, they're covered by the Fair Housing Act. Who is covered? A buyer or a rental with a disability, a person with a disability who will be living in the unit, a person associated with a, with a person with a disability. It could be a living assistant or a relative or a person, as I said, who is perceived to have a disability. Who is not covered? And um, we actually get a fair amount of questions about this. Um, if, if somebody is a current um, user of illegal drugs or alcohol um, or addicted to, uh, currently addicted to a controlled substance, they are not covered by the Fair Housing Act. Um, somebody, and, and also um, uh, the Fair Housing Act does not protect sex offenders. 
Okay, let me go ahead. Okay, covered multifamily housing must be handicap accessible. And I'll, we'll get more into what that is later on, so I'll, I won't go into that now. But um, housing providers must provide reason, reasonable accommodations to rules and practices, and housing providers must permit reasonable modification to physical structures. So the main area, these are the three main areas where disability-related issues come up. If, a, if an apartment complex is not accessible, if uh, if providers don't provide reasonable accommodations or if providers don't pro provide reasonable modifications. The other areas that we sometimes see too though are just straight discrimination against people with disability that they that a, a landlord does not want to rent to somebody with a disability either because of, of, um, of just, they're just, you know, their own um, their own biases or because they're afraid of insurance issues or whatever, but that does happen too. Okay, ready for the next slide. Uh, what are reasonable accommodations? Reasonable accommodations are changes in rules, policies, practices, or services that are necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy housing. Reasonable modifications must be allowed um, and the request has to be acted upon within a reasonable, reasonable time. Um, delay can amount to a, de a denial. Um, one important thing about reasonable accommodations is that a tenant can never be charged a fee for a reasonable accommodation. Uh, examples are uh, service or therapy animals. That is a big one that we, we actually deal with a lot. Waiving a no pets policy, a pet deposit, a pet fee. Um, a uh, service animal is not, con and, or assistance animal is not considered a pet and therefore there can't be a charge for that or they can't be treated as a pet. Uh, permitting live-in aids without requiring that they be added as tenants on a lease. We see that a fair amount. Somebody with a disability may be, um, may need a live-in aid. And if it's subsidized housing, they may want to include that person's income um, uh, to calculate the rent. And that's illegal under the Fair Housing Act. That's one example. Another example might be um, that somebody is only eligible as a single person to have to rent a one uh, a one bedroom apartment, but if they need a live-in aid, they would be eligible for the two bedroom. Um, another example, are, we see this every once in a while, somebody with severe allergies or chem chemical sensitivities might need a reasonable accommodation to forego monthly pest control. That's another example. Um, Another example uh, might be that, and we see this a fair amount, you may have somebody who has a um, history of substance abuse or somebody with a history of mental illness who may have a bad landlord reference. If that landlord reference was related to um, a disability and, um, and the um, tenant can show that they uh, no longer suffer from that from uh, they can say that the the uh, problem was related to the disability then the landlord has to waive considering that um, reference and I'll get into that a little bit more a little bit later too okay ready for the next slide as I said service animals are not pets you can't have weight or breed restrictions. Um, no charge for ordinary wear and tear. For instance, you can't have a um, extra deposit for the animal, but if at the time, if, if the animal does um, cause damage, they can charge for that. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about assistance animals and um, 
we didn't put this on the slide, but I'm going to send you all later a couple of um, authorities to, to take a look at. One is there is guidance from HUD that is dated um, January 28th of this year that talks a lot about the difference between um, the types of assistance animals. And um, I'll, I'll go ahead and get that to you. But basically, there are two types of assistance animals. One are service animals, and service animals are, um, e they, they can either be formally trained or they can be informally trained, but they are, um, they help people with disabilities with, um, uh, in various ways. Examples of service animals are guide dogs, that's the most obvious one. Um, signal or hearing assistance dogs, that could be a dog trained to alert its owner to, um, you know, a phone ringing or to the front door. Um, seizure dogs uh, are trained to alert owners to seizures before they occur. Similarly, there are dogs who are trained to um, alert their owners to um, issues with diabetes. Um, retrieval monkeys, that's not very common, but there are some, I think they're generally like capuchin monkeys that are trained to grab items for people who can't do that. Um, it, it's really important to know that service animals do not need to be professionally trained or licensed because um, some housing providers think that they do need to be and they don't. Okay. Um, the second type are um, therapy animals that we'll get to in a minute. But um, a request uh, before we get too much into this, reasonable accommodations must be granted um, unless they would pose an undue financial and administrative hardship or that the accommodation would fundamentally alter the nature of the complex or enterprise. The first um, requirement is a very high burden. Most, accom most reasonable accommodations are not considered an undue financial and administrative um, hardship. Um, the uh, an accommodation that would fundamentally alter the nature of the complex or enterprise, just to give you an example of what that would be, um, let's say you have somebody, you have a small apartment complex and um, there's only a maintenance person on site once or twice a week and you've got somebody with a mobility impairment and they ask that their trash be picked up every day by the maintenance person. Well, if that maintenance person doesn't come in every day and it's a very small complex, then that might be considered unreasonable. Um, another example would be if um, somebody with a disability asked the manager to take them to the store, you know, or to take them to the doctor. That's not part of what an, um, a manager or, usually, or an apartment complex usually does, so that would not be considered reasonable. But um, in terms of the undue financial burden, that's going to depend on the size of the complex. So if you have like a um, very small complex, that would be a lower bar than if you have a large apartment complex. Okay, ready to go on. Um, exa examples of documentations of disability. Uh, now, the, um, an apartment manager or owner can ask for documentation. Um, it can be a government uh, letter, something like Social Security, SSI, something from the Veterans Affairs, um, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a statement from a doctor or other medical professional, a peer support group, non-medical service agencies, or any reliable third party, including family members which not, with knowledge of the person's disability. This comes up with us a fair amount because um, a lot of times um, providers want to re want to only consider a doctor's letter and um, that is 
that is actually not the case. It, it can be any number of reliable sources. Now, if you if the person with a disability has a doctor's letter, that might be the easiest way because then you don't get into whether these other um, third parties are credible. But um, but the law does not require that it just be a letter from a doctor, and, and that's really important because that does come up a fair bit. Okay. Uh, let me just say a little bit more about that uh, before we get on to reasonable modifications. Um, the uh, if because this isn't in the slide, if the disability is readily apparent from looking at somebody, let's say that it's obvious that the person is blind or the person uses a wheelchair. Um, then, the, then the landlord can't ask for documentation for, shouldn't ask for documentation of the disability. Um, they can ask why the particular um, accommodation is requested, like what is the, what is the connection between the requested accommodation and the uh, accommodation in the disability. But I just wanted to mention that. Okay, we can go on to reasonable modifications. Reasonable modifications are changes to the physical structure of an apartment complex or the common space um, or an apartment that's necessary so that a person with a disability can enjoy the properties the same ways as other residents. Okay. Um, exam let me, before we talk about this, examples are the most common one would be something like a wheelchair ramp. It's a change to the physical structure. Uh, so the requirements are that the, the modification does not cause an undue financial or administrative burden. Again, it's, gonna, it, it's going to depend on what the request is and the size of the complex. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, a walk-in shower, somebody may need a walk-in shower. Well, if you have a very small complex, that it may be an undue administrative burden or financial burden in this case, um, to change a regular bathtub into a walk-in shower, it may or may not. Um, but if you have an, a, a large apartment complex, that's probably not going to be considered an undue financial burden, and we have had that come up a few times. Um, it will not cause harm or damage to others, and it does not involve a fundamental alteration to the property. Um, an example of that might be, um, let's say you have somebody on the second floor who is requesting a, an elevator. Well, if there are no elevators in the complex, that's gonna be considered a fundamental alteration. On the other hand, that person could ask for a reasonable um, accommodation to be moved to a first floor apartment. Okay, um, examples of reasonable modifications, um, widening doorways, installing grab bars in bathrooms, lowering kitchen cabinets for use for, by people in wheelchairs, allowing wheelchair ramps or curb cuts, installing a visual doorbell or fire alarm, um, removing a bathtub to install a roll-in shower. As I said, that, you know, that is probably the most expensive of the ones that are listed here. Okay. In most cases, a tenant must pay for modifications, and that what's, that's what makes modifications different from, um, from the accommodations. However, the um, uh, it, the cost is still relevant in because if the property receives federal funding, then the landlord is responsible for the cost of the modification. And so you would get into the analysis of um, is it an undue financial burden? Um, landlords cannot ex assess additional security deposits or fees for modifications. Okay. Restoration of premises. Um, this is after the tenant moves out. A landlord can require that a tenant restore the premises to the original condition at the tenant's expense, um, you know, except of course if it's, it's federally funded. 
um, if the modifications are extensive and would interfere with the next tenant's use and enjoyment of the unit. An example would be um, lower cabinets. Maybe if the cabinets are at wheelchair level, and um, then you could say that that would be difficult for, um, an, for the next tenant. Um, widened doorways would not have to be restored because that doesn't harm anybody. Um, landlords can only require restoration for interior modifications, not for public or common use areas. And um, common use areas uh, can be also areas where a tenant would ask for reasonable accommodation. An example would that would, for that would be um, uh, maybe steps going up to a swimming pool or to the, um, or maybe mailboxes or, or the dumpsters, if they're not accessible, a tenant could ask that they be made accessible. Okay, ready for the next one. Um, can a landlord ask an applicant about their disability? If an applicant says that he or she is disabled, the landlord may ask if any modifications or accommodations to live in the apartment or condominium, condominium will be necessary. The landlord can ask for documentation of the need for any accommodation or modification. However, the landlord can't ask the, the applicant about the nature of his or her disability. So they can't say, well, what is your disability? They can say, um, if the disability isn't obvious, they can ask for documentation that the person has a disability, but they can't ask about the disability. And um, although, and they can ask about the need for the accommodation. Okay. Uh, can a landlord ask if a tenant can live independently? The answer to that is no. And we do see that come up a fair amount too. A landlord cannot ask whether a disabled person can live independently. And that's because it's up to the person asking for the apartment to determine whether they can live independently or not. And they're entitled to a live-in aid. Um, this actually comes up in um, a fair amount in um, elderly independent living. If somebody is over a certain age, um, the, um, the complex may ask for proof that they can live independently. That actually happens a lot and that's illegal under the Fair Housing Act. Okay, next slide, accessibility issues. Now, um, the accessibility requirements of the Fair Housing Act uh, apply to complexes that were built for first occupancy after March 13, 1991. So um, if a complex is, is about 30 years old, it's covered by the Fair Housing Act, a, a fair, 30 years old or newer. Um, it also covers complexes of four or more units um, and all first floor uh, units have to be accessible. If there's an elevator, then all units have to be accessible. Okay. What must be accessible? Uh, accessible building at the units must have an accessible building entrance on an accessible route including accessible parking spaces. So somebody has to be able to get from the parking lot into the unit. Um, accessible and usable public and common use areas, I already mentioned that. Usable doors, accessible routes into and through the apartment, light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, and other environmental controls have to be in accessible locations. Reinforced walls in the bathrooms are required for later installation of grab bars if somebody needs that. And um, each unit has to have usable kitchens and bathrooms. That means somebody in a wheelchair has to be able to pivot in the, um, in the bathroom and in the kitchen. Uh, there are, there are, we, requirements set out for this. And if anybody would like more details about this, I'll be happy to get that to you. Okay, 
ready for the next one. Um, when you know the fair housing laws and follow them, everybody wins. Um, I just want to add a few more things about um, about you know because we're speaking in pretty general terms here. Um, as I said, if you want more information, I'm going to send two things. One, there is um, a, there is a joint um, HUD DOJ statement on reasonable accommodations that is very good and gives a lot of examples about um, accommodations and modifications. Um, and I'm going with, I'm going to send the um, the January 2020 HUD guidance on um, assistance animals also to everybody. Um, but I, I just wanted to give, before we stop, just a couple examples of, of cases that we have had that, that illustrate some of these points. Um, one example about having a history of, um, of a disability um, or um, uh, or having history of mental illness. The Fair Housing Act does not require a, a landlord to rent to somebody who um, who is who will who will present a danger to the complex or to other residents. So, but even if somebody does present or has presented in the past a danger because of mental illness or because of substance abuse, the landlord has to look at the current situation and there's, whether there's any way to deal with it. An example of that is we had a case where um, a tenant suff uh, suffered from schizophrenia. And, but when, they took, when the tenant took her medication, um, every, and the symptoms were under control. She was a fine tenant, um, but she lost her job, which meant that she lost her um, medical insurance. And um, so she stopped, she couldn't afford the medication and she stopped taking the medication. Well, she went to um, the, the office one day, she was expecting a package and she got very upset because the package wasn't there. And she started, um, she became very disruptive and she threatened to kill the manager. And so the um, manager, not surprisingly, um, filed to evict her. And the, the tenant came to see us after the eviction was already filed, but before the case, before she was ordered evicted. Well, when we looked into the matter, we found out that she, that she was not able to take her medication and we were able to, um, uh, we were able to resolve that issue and um, find, we contacted a social worker who was able to help her, us to get her the medication and to make sure that she went in, uh, that she went back to her counselor and we were able to resolve that issue. And so I, I wanted to mention that example of that's a, that's a situation that seems very extreme um, and yet we were able to work it out. And in most cases, we are able to work out these, these matters. So even up to the point of the date of eviction. So, um, so the Fair Housing Act is a very, very useful um, tool for anybody who is representing people with disabilities. And we are here to help. And so if anybody has any questions, please call us anytime. And um, we're open for questions. Okay. Uh, so Faith, I, or, well, either of you really, We've gotten one question um, and they're saying regarding disability um, and people with lingering symptoms of COVID after they've caught COVID and are hopefully on the recovery bound, um, how many or how landlords and tenants can go about it safely and such. So um, I guess COVID related disability concerns and navigating COVID. Okay, um, yeah, this is an evolving problem, isn't it? Um, uh, and I'm sure we're going to, to see more of this. Um, we, have, we have had a, 
um, I can think of one example where we had a woman call us a few weeks ago where the landlord thought that her child had been exposed to COVID or had COVID and didn't want to rent to her. And um, that would be illegal. COVID would be covered by, um, would be covered as a disability. Um, I'm trying to think of examples where other examples, other than not wanting to rent to somebody, um, uh, maybe you might have a requirement that the, um, that the, you have to go in person to pay rent, um, and the landlord won't go to the, um, to the person's apartment to pick up the rent. You could have a situation like that where a reasonable accommodation might be necessary of, um, leaving, uh, you know, just finding another way to pay rent or finding another way to have um, maintenance people come in. Kim, can you think of, of uh, more on that? Yeah, so the other thing that I can think of, and we've gotten, I think, two calls along this lines, is um, people with disabilities that either impair their breathing or their immune system, yeah. um, where they're being asked to have maintenance men in their home or having the landlord wanting to show the home for re-rental to somebody else. Um, so having worked out accommodations to postpone showings of homes or postpone maintenance or um, find a way to make that maintenance as, um, le I guess, uh, pose the least risk to the person as possible, whether um, you limit it to one person in the home, make sure that that person has advance notice so that they may be, be out of the home and out of safe distance. Um, those are, I think, the COVID concerns that we're seeing with regards to reasonable accommodations. Um, and most of it, most people that we've worked with so far anyways, have been very understanding, um, very willing to negotiate. There's been maybe one housing provider or so who uh, gave a little pushback saying, you know, it's her property. She should be able to show it when she wanted to. Um, but the, the conversation ended nicely enough. Um, so that's the only other COVID things that we've seen. I think everybody just has to understand that this is um, very new. We don't know how long, um, if we don't know if COVID's going to have lingering, long-lasting symptoms or if it becomes a disability because not all temporary illnesses qualify as disability. Um, and I think we have to wait for the science to catch up on some of it. Um, but for now, to proceed with caution and to grant the accommodations if they're requested is the advice I would give to landlords and housing providers if they called. Um, any other questions or concerns from anybody that we didn't cover, you wanted some additional information on or anything else? I think. Give just a second. Um, normally we get so many about animals um, <laughs> and which breeds and what type and do I really have to let you? Um, but I don't see anything else coming in right now. Um, if you think of any questions or concerns, please contact us. Um, if we can assist you in any way, we would like to. I think I, thank you for, um, for, you know, for your time. And um, again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to call us. The number's on the screen and, and we're happy to help. Or if you, if you know of anybody who you think um, we can help with these issues, you know, please feel free to give us a call. Also, check out our website. We also have uh, printable uh, information there as far as landlord-tenant laws and the uh, Fair Housing Act. So you can actually go there and read um, and educate yourself a little bit on uh, the laws. Okay, so again, thank you for taking time out of your morning to 
learn about the Fair Housing Act. Thank you for all of our participants. I know we had a very wide variety, everybody from law students to um, HUD grant managers uh, to, um, to several attorneys with uh, legal services um, and uh, several disability groups are able to join us. And I'm, you know, if this can be of any help to your constituents or you need any additional guidance, please, please contact us and we would love um, to help you out. Yes. And thank you. Thank again you for very your time. much. Guys. Thank you a lot. Take care. Bye.